it's um, it's not a Okay, if you want to bring back a chair, Tom, do or it's actually a couple left, uh, you know, so you can sit. Um, okay, guys, welcome. We just had a short little break, and hopefully, you did at home and you're back with us. Uh, so we're going to have the second half, which is shorter than the first half. So it's not a half; it's two thirds and a third. Um, <laughs> I'm very good at math. Uh, so just a quick reminder to people online, you know, that even though you're not in Albany, we would love your support. As a member of the museum, you can go to our website, irish-us.org. It's our birthday this year, we're 35, so you can donate to the campaign if you don't want to become a member. But we do have you know, perks for members in terms of um, a members only newsletter, a discount at the shop. And if you come in at the $100 level, you get recip reciprocity with the North American um, Reciprocal Museum Program. So that lets you into about 1200 museums across the country. So we're very good value. And we could do with your support. We're delighted to be able to offer all of these events you know, online and expand our reach beyond Albany, but of course it does take uh, running and, and we do need support to be able to keep having speakers and performers and cultural events come. So that's just our little uh, you know, PSA. So I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint now and um, we'll go back to Task the Feathers. But thank you everyone. Hold on. Morning. No, no, back. This one, this way. Okay, that's it. This is not the worst. <laughs> okay, it's okay. We're good. We promised you a happy second half, and we will get to it. But we have to do. <laughs> we have to go through one more little <laughs> trial first. We're Irish. <laughs> Said, not everyone found a better life here. Many, many people came, but they came into work that was really arduous and very often dangerous, whether they were in mines or factories or laundries. They were working very hard. There was no OSHA. The pay was minimal. Their diets were poor and their living conditions were harsh and many languished under all of that. Especially when you came alone and you're a young woman, you have no family support here. It was a very hard life. So we are offering the song, Dairy So Fair, which comes from the Cottle McConnell collection for all the Irish who died here, working to make a better life for themselves and for their families back home. And we follow it with the Battle of Ockram which commemorates a very devastating defeat that the Irish suffered in 1680 at the hands of the Protestant forces fighting for William of Orange. <laughs> Of the fair shores of her own native Ireland, she left them at noon on a fine summer day. She bid goodbye to her friends and companions, and she sailed for America so far away. Twas little she thought as she stepped up that finery that bore her away from that fine sunny shore. Twas little she thought as she stepped on that finery that her home below the dairy she would never see more. She landed on Sunday in New York's big city with everyone busy and no one who cared. She stared in surprise at those New York tall buildings and she wished she were back in her daily so fair. For four years she worked in a big milking dry now. The hours they were long and no sun did shine there. The roses soon left the fair cheeks of young Edna, and she pined like a caged bird for her 
cemetery so fair. One night as she slept in the cold attic chamber, she dreamed that her own darling mother was there. Twas the angel of death that had softly called for her, and it bore away young death from this sad world of care. Twas little she thought as she stepped on that lonely, the poor earth away from that bright and sunny shore. Twas little she thought as she stepped on that lonely, that her own beloved daddy she would never see more. After that, we need a hero <laughs> to come and help us. And Ireland sent one. Ireland sent a very wonderful hero. So thousands of Irish women were working in the collar laundries and in textile mills all over this area, while thousands of men, Irish men, were working as iron molders in Troy and Waterville. They were making nails and axes, horseshoes, ammunition, bells, very important bell companies here cooking stoves, heating stoves, all of it was grueling, dangerous work for very long hours and minimal pay. Kate Mullaney was born in County Roscommon in 1841 and emigrated when she was 12 years old with her family, her mother and father and younger siblings. And they came into New York and up to, and settled in Troy. When her father died working, Kate went to work in the collar laundries in Troy to support her mother and her younger siblings. And she worked 14 hours a day and was paid $2 a week. And that's what the family lived on. In 1864, at the age of 23, Kate organized 300 women as the collar laundry union and they struck for better pay. They stayed out for six days and they received some support because certainly on $2 a week, you can't go without pay. They received some support from the nascent Iron Molders Union and they won. 
their strike. They want a 25% pay increase. Kate kept her union together and continued to pressure the mill of the laundry owners for better pay and better work conditions. And then in 1866, when the iron molders struck, the collar laundry union supported them too. She married John Fogarty, who was an iron molder, and they lived in the house which Kate's mother had originally bought with Kate's wages. And this, is, this house is on the corner of Hoosick and 8th Street. It's now a national park site. They were working on the interior. It was scheduled to open, who knows when, because of COVID, but it was scheduled to open. And sadly, on St. Patrick's Day, no less, a truck drove through the back mm -hmm. wall. And ugh. so it will eventually open and it will be an important national park site. In 1868, Kate was the first woman appointed to the National Labor Union Board, which was itself a new organization. And her heroism and tremendous activity, not only in her own union, but in supporting the Iron Molders Union and others as well, made Albany second only to Philadelphia as the significant center of developing labor organization. So for Kate, I looked everywhere for a union song from her era and just struck out. I think she was a woman ahead of her time. And so we went ahead of her time to find a song that really honors her spirit. We are gonna sing Woody Guthrie's song, Union Made, and follow it with a march called Fogarty's March, composed by Patty O'Brien. <laughs> Deputy sheriffs who made the raid. She went to the union hall when there was strike, she called. And when the company boys came round, she always stood her ground. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. No, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. To the day I die.
So among the immigrants to uh, Troy in the 1870s is a fellow named Edward Cronin, who is uh, from County Tipperary and was a weaver by trade. He didn't find work as a weaver in Troy, unfortunately, so just whatever jobs he could get. He was also a fine fiddle player and very, very knowledgeable in Irish traditional dance music. Um, later in his life, when he moved to Chicago, he was discovered by Captain Francis O'Neill, who collected a lot of tunes from Edward Cronin. And those tunes were first published in this uh, very influential dance music Ireland during the time. So it's great to think. So there are only two recordings of Edward Cronin's music that still exist. They were part of Francis O'Neill's private collection of uh, cylinders, like wax cylinders, that he had made between like 1902 and 1903, something like that. And they were thought destroyed or at least lost um, for quite a long time until they were discovered in an attic in 2002, almost just 100 years after they were originally created. So we're very fortunate to, to have those, um, to hear uh, how, you know, hear the, the playing of, of a master of the instrument. There is one particular tune that um, people for years had thought was just sort of messed up in the uh, dance music of Ireland. It's called Banished Misfortune. It's a very popular jig. And it turns out that the transcription in the book was from Edward Cronin's playing. He just has a very unusual setting for that particular tune. So Cronin uh, was very well known for his hornpipes in particular. So we're going to play two hornpipes that he contributed to the dance music of Ireland. Uh, the first one is Chief O'Neill's favorite, and the second one is Autumn Waters. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> no surprises. <laughs> Thank you. 
<clears throat> now we'll hear about the Flanagan brothers who were an Albany a success story. In fact, uh, the banjo tunes that we played earlier uh, were actually, that was actually a pair of jigs that were recorded by the Flanagans in 1923. Um, they were uh, local boys who made it big. The Flanagan brothers, obviously a musical family act. Uh, they went on to record dozens and dozens of 78s in the 20s and 30s, but, but they had originally come from Waterford, Ireland when the boys were very little. Uh, they, in 1911, they came from Waterford to Albany because they knew some people who had already settled in Albany. And so the boys grew up in Albany, taught themselves various musical instruments. It was a uh, humble beginnings. Uh, Mike Flanagan, shown here with a banjo, he taught himself mandolin on a mandolin that he literally plucked out of a fire, <laughs> as in, oh wait, is that a mandolin? Oh, don't, don't burn that, I could use that. <laughs> so humble beginnings, they taught themselves music. As young men, they went down to New York City, uh, they worked their day jobs, and at night they would go down to the dance halls, which was a very important part of the Irish social scene, and they would play the live uh, dance music, the traditional jigs and reels and Irish dance music for the dance halls. And then later they went on to record dozens of these 78s, which, uh, and they weren't just popular locally. Once they signed with a major label, the 78s were sold back across the Atlantic as well. So this, they were very well-known musical artists in the 20s and 30s. And Mike, uh, Mike was a pioneer in, in that he used the banjo for Irish melody. Uh, I, I believe he was the first to record Irish tunes on the banjo. So I will pick up the banjo again and we'll play a, another set of tunes. These ones are reels. I believe they were the B-side from the 78 that we played the jigs earlier. Uh, the B-side, uh, these tunes are The Maid Behind the Bar and The Teetotaler, which were recorded during prohibition. So I'm not sure what to make of that message, but uh, here are some more reels from the Flanagans. <laughs> Baseball, Troy, the city of Troy turns out has a 
has a lot of baseball history. And the, the Troy team, the Trojans, was in the National League for a while, around 1880. Uh, and so Troy gave us some of the early baseball Hall of Famers, some of whom were Irish. If we see some of them here. On the right, there's Tim Keefe. He played for the Trojans, a famous pitcher. On the left is uh, Mike King Kelly, who was a very colorful character, sort of a sports celebrity. Mike uh, was born in Troy. His parents came to Troy uh, to escape the famine. And Mike is famous, among other things, for inventing sliding, as in home plate, as in the, the hook slide. Uh, and so and th that became popular. And somebody actually wrote a song, slide, Kelly, slide. <laughs> And it, I believe it was actually made into a movie, if you can picture that. But... <laughs> and in the middle is Johnny Evers. Johnny was born in Troy. He was the grandson of an Irish immigrant. Um, and he went on to play baseball in the major leagues, famous in particular for his years with the Chicago Cubs. And at the end of his career, he came back to Albany and he opened the Johnny Evers Sporting Goods Store, you know, put that famous name to good use. Um, and now, Johnny is famous in particular because he was part of a famous Cubs double play, Tinker to Evers to Chance. That was Joe Tinker, shortstop, throwing to Johnny Evers on second to Frank Chance on first. And the Cubs apparently were just a, a well-oiled machine at executing this double play, and it helped them win big time. The Cubs won the World Series two years in a row, 1907 and 8. And so the Chicago Cubs were on top of the world. And it Granted, you know, they, they couldn't see that on the horizon there was a century-long drought that <laughs> was waiting for them, but that came later. Back then, the Cubs were really on top of the world, and so these players were somewhat famous. But the thing that really cemented uh, their fame was actually just a little poem. There was a New York columnist who uh, one day decided to end his column by tacking on a little eight-line bit of baseball poetry about the tinker to Evers to chance double play. It was nothing epic, literally eight lines, but for whatever reason, it really just clicked with baseball fans. They love it. They, they still remember it to this day. Uh, some people do that, that phrase, tinker to Evers to chance, as sort of synonymous with a well-oiled machine. And because the poem is remembered, those players are remembered as well. In fact, Johnny Evers, about 15 years after he was done playing baseball, he was on a radio interview and he thanked the author of that poem saying, if it wasn't for that poem, people would have forgotten about me a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, they were not forgotten. Tinker and Evers and Chance were inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1946. Uh, instead of reading the little poem, I'll sing you a song. Somebody reworked the poem substantially to turn it into a song. So I'll sing you that. Both the poem and song use a word that I had not known previously, gonfalon. It's an Italian word meaning pennant. So here is Tinker to Evers to Chance. Oh. Indeed. We're hoping. <laughs> you never know with us. Some years before Wrigley's romance, twas tinker to Evers to chance. A trio of fair cubs with lightning between gloves, they played like a waltz in striped pants. As soon as a hit would arise, you'd see lights go off in their eyes. When turning that double, they're nothing but trouble. It's tinker to Evers to chance. side grounds, the best friends to those on the mound. 
win killers with he's just a six four to three then ruthlessly gone full unbound as soon as a hit would arise you'd see lights go off in their eyes when turning that double they're nothing but trouble it's tinker to evers to chance Songsters here. They would do, uh, among other things, a presentation they called a panorama or Hibernicon. <laughs> and Hibernicon was a tour of Ireland where they it was illustrated by giant um, scrolls of canvas on, on which were painted uh, scenes of, of cities. Uh, vistas, that sort of thing, um, historical events. And the Hibernicon consisted of a couple of lectures. Um, it was a tour by jaunting car around Ireland, which I believe that's the jaunting car. It is, that. yes. Yeah. So uh, there, there, would be, there would be some lectures, there, there were some uh, musical numbers, there were uh, comic skits, and that sort of thing. And at the end of the, the whole tour of Ireland, uh, they'd leave the audience back at the docks, uh, waiting for the ship to take them back to America. A uh, very famous uh, Irish piper named Patsy Tui, who was born in uh, Galway in 1865, he immigrated to the US, uh, I think at the age of either two or three, something like that. He picked up the Dillon pipes uh, when he was 11. And by the time he was 20 years old, he had joined Harry and Tiberians. Um, and then he later uh, joined another traveling vaudeville crew called Race. And I, I've got to get this right, excuse me here. It's Race and Barton's Gaiety Spectacular Extravaganza. <laughs> um, big man. Great show. <laughs> yeah. Good show, right? Yeah. Um, but he, uh, Patsy Tui, uh, ended up, like, he spent his, his whole life basically traveling and, and working on the, on the vaudeville stage. Um, fantastic piper, like I said. He um, recorded a couple of 78s, I believe there were three 78 RPM records that, uh, that survived, well, that, that he recorded. And we're fortunate in that that same collection of wax cylinders that was discovered in, <laughs> in the attic in 2002 contained many, many more uh, samples or examples of Patsy Tui's play. So we have, we're very fortunate to have even more than, than just those, those uh, six 78 RPM sides. In November of 1898, Grayson Barton's Gaty Spectacular Extravaganza Company performed at a theater called Gaty Theater on Green Street in Alden, which no longer exists. It's a parking lot now. Uh, probably not a bad name. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a notorious theater. Uh, it was a burlesque house. And it was owned by the only female burlesque uh, owner. And she owned three, uh, in the whole US actually, she owned three different burlesque houses one in Albany, the, the Lyceum of Troy, and one called uh, Electra, I believe, in, in Schenectady. And the, that 
particular theater was uh, known colloquially as the cuspidor because um, we, we really didn't want to, to be out in, in the main audience because it was like chewing tobacco. It was male only audience. Um, and so really a, a scene place. Um, it, I believe, was demolished in the 1930s after the burn. It, it had burned many times. <laughs> We're going to play um, a couple of. <laughs> Yeah, wasn't wasn't a great great spot, but he was he was on the on the tour. But we're gonna play uh, a couple of tunes that uh, came from this those wax cylinders. Uh, the first one is uh, Miss My Hands, and the second is sort of appropriately the ladies' pantalettes. <laughs> to the Flanagan brothers. Uh, they didn't just record the dance tunes. They also remember they grew up back when vaudeville was a thing and they sang as well. And some of the songs they sang were more in the vein of vaudeville. Some of the songs were silly. Uh, and sometimes they would preface a comical song with a bit of, I guess you could think of it as vaudeville style stand up comedy. Uh, so I will recreate for you now the, the, the comedic stylings of the Flanagan brothers from their 1926 hit. The night Pat Murphy died. <laughs> hey, Joe, what is it? You look awful sad. Whatever's the matter? Oh, I lost a dear friend, Patty Murphy. Did you hear? No, oh, whatever happened? Well, he was working up there on the scaffolding up on the 14th floor and he fell, he fell to the ground. Oh, dear St. Patrick. Did he die then? Well, of course he died. It would be a miracle not dying, falling from such a height. So, oh, yes. I guess that would be a, a sudden stop. <laughs> that weren't the worst of it, neither. The boss said I was the one who had to go break the news to his wife as gentle as I could. Oh my, well, how did she take it? Well, I went up the stairs and I banged on her door and I says, are you the widow Murphy? And she says, well, I'm, I'm Mrs. Murphy, but I ain't a widow. And I says, you ain't seen what we're dragging up the stairs. 
Well, at any rate, we all had a good time at the wake. You sang a song at the wake. Did you know? What, I mean, what song would you sing at someone's wake? When I sang, The Night Pat Murphy Died. <laughs> oh, on that night, Pat Murphy died, a night I'll ne'er forget. All the boys was drinking hard. Some ain't sober yet. As long as a bottle was passed around, everyone was feeling gay. Till O'Leary showed with bagpipes some music for to play. Mrs. Murphy sat in a corner, pouring out her grief. Then Kelly and his pal, that dirty Robin thief, they snuck into the ante room and a bottle of whiskey stole and put the bottle on the corpse to keep the liquor cold. Sure, and that's how they showed their respect for Patty Murphy. That's how they showed their honor and their pride. They said it was a sin and a shame when they went at one another. And every drink in the wake house went, the night Pat Murphy died. in the evening some dirty blue-eyed scamp wrote up on the coffin lid here lies a tramp they stopped the clock so mrs murphy couldn't tell the time and at a quarter after three they told her it was nine now the whole dang gang was merry sure they didn't care a thread mrs murphy said she wished that all of them was dead all the tricks I ever saw that made me shiver with fear. They took the ice off the corpse and put it on the beer. Sure, and that's how they showed their respect for Patty Murphy. That's how they showed their honor and their pride. They said it was a sin and a shame and winked at one another. And every drink in the wake house went, I had Murphy died. in the morning the procession left the house everyone but poor old mrs murphy was half soused they stopped halfway to the graveyard at the old red door saloon they all went in at half past eight and didn't come out till noon someone asked old finnegan if anyone had died well says he i'm not quite sure i just came for the ride they went off to the graveyard so holy and sublime, but found out when they got there they'd left the corpse behind. Sure, and that's how they showed their respect for Patty Murphy. That's how they showed their honor and their pride. They said it was a sin and shame, and they went at one another. And every drink in the wake house went, like Pat Murphy died. Thank you for indulging me. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for having us. That was our last complete song. We're just going to uh, do a little bit of a uh, reprise here. Say good night with a song. Hmm? Say good night with a song. Say, yeah. say good night with a, a bit of a song. Yeah. joking together there was nothing our minds to enthrall oh if happiness be in this wide world i am sure it is on the canal and it's fair you well father and mother and likewise to all Ireland too and fare you well sister and brother 
so kindly I'll bid you adieu. Thank you all for coming out, and thank you, Elizabeth, for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, guys. That was great. So the band are Amy, David, and Dave, or Dave and Dave. Uh, their website is tossthefeathers.band. Dot band. And if you need any more information, contact the museum. And just to remind you, on Thursday, we have Dr. Dara Downey from Trinity College Dublin, who will talk about the Irish superstitious maid in American Gothic uh, literature for Halloween. So that's going to be live here or on Zoom. So you go to our website uh, to register for the Zoom link if you want that or watch it on Facebook. And just a small little note, we're thinking next month the events will stream to our YouTube page instead of to Facebook. But we'll put that, um, all of those information. And we can still share it to Facebook, but not everybody has Facebook. Uh, so YouTube might be a safer option. So good night, everyone. Thank you to our live audience. Thank you to the band. Thank you to Hudson Valley. And we'll talk to you on Thursday. Take care. <laughs>